At this conference will now be recorded. While we're waiting for a few more people to start, I know that some of you might know the answer to this um, question. Let me forward it a little bit and get that at least started. Oh man, you already asked this on another call and I don't remember. Mm-hmm. I Is did. And, uh, yes, that's all I remember. Dr. Dave was one of I the can't. founders of iTree and he knows the answers so he can't. I can't he answer. It. I know. He was the one who named it. The better question is why is there a dash in the name? When we named it, when we named it iTree, we got a uh, the uh, legal department from Apple Computer it came oh. down hard on us, and so we had to get the whole legal team in Washington involved, and so <laughs> they came up with a compromise. What if we call it i dash tree, and everybody was happy? That's amazing. I thought it was for the, the dramatic pause. No, no, it was because True. Apple had just come out with the um, you know, the i iPhone and the iPad or the i. Let's see, what did they have first? Uh, what yeah. is, iPod wasn't that the first one? iPod, yes. Yeah. iPod. They had just come out with the iPad when we started i i tree, and so they had the iPod and the um, the iPad, and they said no, they have all the rights to anything i with the small i in front, so. We said, okay, so then we came up with i-tree, so it worked out fine. <laughs> and now I think they own the letter i outright, don't they, Dave? Yeah, 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 I have to take it out of the language, and we have to take it out of the alphabet. Yeah. Yeah. I, think we missed a, I think we missed a big opportunity to get a general donation at that point, though. but the legal team doesn't think that way. But I, I thought it was it would have been a good opportunity But no one knows the answer. We haven't had that. No. Mike, do you, re do you remember what it is? He's, he's turned his camera off because he's looking it up, I think. Christian I don't Parker think will know. I'm not sure where you're going to find that answer. If it's on, on your Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> it's the inventory of tree resources. Wait, wait, wait. Well, okay, here it goes. I, does anyone else got it? Oh, there it is. There it is. There was no name for it, and it was a partnership of the U4 project with um, uh, with uh, uh, Dave Nowak in um, Syracuse and the. Stratum project with Greg McPherson on the West Coast, and so it was called the Integrated Tree something, and it was a longer name. And I said, well, let's get something short. So this came and worked out perfect. It's very snappy. I like it. Yeah, easy to remember. So, can we go ahead and get started? I think we have. Yeah enough people and folks will join okay. in once we start to. Uh, yeah, thanks I, I everyone a... for, oh sure, go ahead. Oh sorry, is it, uh, is it better for the overall quality of the, uh, the audio and the visual for people if we turn our cameras off or does that not matter? Yeah, um, we can, and then we'll let you yeah. know when to turn it on. Okay. And if there's questions, Except you're asked, asked, feel Allison. free to, yeah, feel free to put them in the chat box. I'll be monitoring. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today um, for the session on engaging youth in science and stewardship using iTree. Today, we have with us Dr. David Boniars, an urban forester with an extensive background in urban forest management and landscape design. 
Working as a scientist with the Urban Natural Resources Institute, Dr. Dave serves on the iTree development team, providing technical and programming support for this inventory and analysis initiative. Also presenting today is Liza Piqueo, an Urban Outreach and Partnership Specialist with the U.S. Forest Service International Program. Liza works closely to engage audiences of all ages and abilities in schools and communities in the United States and around the world. Liza has co-coordinated the International Seminar on Urban Forestry and Community Engagement and also works closely with other IP colleagues on convening the Delhi Urban Network. Dr. Dave and Liza, along with Al Zelaya of the Davy Trees, have presented two sessions on engaging youth with iTree to the members of the Delhi Urban Network. Through this topic, we have explored ways to engage youth with iTree concepts, both through field and classroom experiences. The third of those sessions will end in July with presentations by various network members who will create projects to engage their own young audiences. With that, I'll turn it over to Liza to get us started. Hi, everyone. Good morning. I think I know everybody um, and have yet to meet Lucretia, but um, I'm going to just give a basic overview on why I treat and youth. And I know that many of you have heard about iTree, and if you haven't, please let us know in the chat. But essentially, as you know, the Forest Service works to improve lives worldwide in urban and rural areas. And we work with a variety of partners, and one of them is research and development of the Forest Service. And we bring the research and the tools such as iTree, and hopefully later down the road, we'll, we can talk about STUMAP and rapid social assessment and other tools and approaches that research has developed um, and how we can apply it on the ground. And with us is Dr. Dave um, with research and development from the Northern Research Station. And um, together, we want to engage all audiences of all communities and all abilities and all ages in participating in science and stewardship. But today we're gonna to focus on young people. So why youth? And we are seeing that there's this intersection between an exploding youth population and a growing environmental crisis. It's staggering to think that 42% of the global population is under 25 years old. Just to give you an example, India is one of the youngest populations, one of the youngest countries out there with a median age of 29. And then 60% of young people in the cities are under the age of 18. Now you couple that with some of the challenges that we're facing right now. And it makes you think, why young people? So you have this burgeoning population and it's um, growing, but it's also an opportunity. You have more voters, scientists, stewards, influencers, agents of change, innovators, teachers, and lawmakers. So that's the opportunity that we wanna take away from this. So currently, there's a huge gap between urban populations and urban youth and also nature. And we want to bridge that gap. And how do we do that? In urban outreach and partnership, we do that by starting outside the front door. What's in the backyard? We want to expose kids early and in various ways. We want to connect through emotion. We want to create a sense of wonder, make it fun for the kids to engage and then get them into the science. And here we have um, Joe Santiago with our team with her non-releasable rehabilitated raptors. And she brings these lives raptors to various audiences and gets kids to connect that way. We make youth feel part of a greater mission through citizen science, um, through being part of an online or a community activity or effort. We wanna involve the family, 
the local churches, the local relig religious leaders, the um, policy makers, et cetera. And then we want to train the young people to train others. They need to become the mentors. And lastly, we want to scaffold the learning. And we engage them through sciences, through technology, engineering, arts, math. And I would even say that E should also be English literature and composition. So we'll talk briefly about ITRI and youth and how we can link these two together because they seem like two really different ideas that may not necessarily come together in a congruent way, in a cohesive way. But before that, just to step back a little, let's talk about ITRI and what it is. So ITRI is a free and online tool developed by um, the Forest Service about 14 years ago with partners such as Davy Trees. Dr. Dave was one of our founders. And it's being used now by over 130 countries, 330,000 users. And it's being used to assess the structure, ecosystem services, and values of your urban forest resources. But more importantly, it can be used by anyone of any age. And it's a powerful tool to provide data about the trees, especially in cities around the world where you don't have that much information about your tree resources. So just to give you an, uh, just to show you the map of where it's being used and where we have whole country integration, which means that eco has been built out and we have location, city, pollution, weather, and species data for these countries and or for just for cities. So right now we are building out eco in New Delhi, India. So just to take a little break, for those who have heard of iTree, can you just blurt it out loud or say it in the chat? What benefits can iTree estimate or calculate? Can you guys just blurt it out? We'd love to hear your voices too. Just still too early for a, to ask these questions. <laughs> what do we have here, Allison? Let's see. Yeah, Karen says they can costs. reduce energy costs, carbon sequestration. Right. Excellent. Anybody else? Reduction in water runoff. Great. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay. Awesome. Just keep typing it in, and let's see if your answers are in there. Beauty, nice, yeah. So here are just some of the um, values, and Dr. Dave will talk more about this later, that iTree can estimate. And as you can see, um, you have some of your, some of the things that you've mentioned in there, but it can also, in some places, look at human health impact, look at pest and disease susceptibility, um, wildlife suitability, it can look at the monetary value of trees as well. This is an example of an urban forest management plan that used iTree. This is in Colima, Mexico. And thank you to Rachel Sheridan and Fabiola um, who helped develop iTree Eco in Mexico. And as you can see here, we're looking at these benefits and how much they're worth in terms of um, the metrics, but also of the monetary value, carbon storage, runoff, sequestration, and removal of pollution. Ooh, Dr. Dave says, don't forget air quality. Absolutely. And iTree, once you've get, gotten the data, it can answer a lot of questions, especially for urban forest managers. It can answer these um, questions. But it's not just limited to urban forest managers. As we said, anyone can use iTree. NGOs, lawmakers, academics, foresters, advocates, and of course, educators and students. So why do we want to link iTree to youth? Well, we are living in a very data-driven world now. And 
where we need the science to back up our decision making. And kids need to learn that from a young age. Here we have a really powerful tool to provide data about trees. But before we can get kids to understand and care for their natural resources around them, we need them to get into the science, entice them to learn, bring in the science, and then plant the seeds for deeper learning and for stewardship. And hopefully that will get them in the habit of data-driven decision-making. But there are a lot of assumptions about ITRI that could prevent people from really engaging young people into it. And here are some of them. It's difficult to teach. It's intimidating and complicated. You need expensive tech. We work in a lot of cities that are under-resourced and disinvested. So not everybody can have a smartphone or an iPad. Maybe it's only for older kids. Some people think it's not fun. If you involve kids, can, do they even know how to collect good data? What does that even mean? And then so what? So you're teaching kids about iTree. What's the bigger picture here? Well, in order to break down the assumptions, we need to, the first step is to break down the biggest assumption of them all and getting rid of iTree. Not the tool, but the name. Just talking about iTree, sometimes people get, think that it's too technical and it's too intimidating. But if you just put that aside for a second, not maybe not necessarily get rid of it, just put it aside for this for a second and highlight the principles behind the tool, which is really the ecosystem services um, of a tree, the products and the values that trees provide. <clears throat> you start with that, and then you get ex the students excited with the science. You link it then to iTree and what it can do. Then you can go deeper into the tool, uh, or maybe not. Maybe you just stick with the principles of it. You create classroom and field activities that are fun for different ages, and then you explore the tool or the principles behind it with or without technology. My thing is not advancing. There it is. And the big and before you even explore anything, and Dr. Dave will talk more about this, get kids outside, observe, draw, take notes, and let them learn about and take a good look at the canopy, the tree resources, what's living near the roots or in the trees or up in the crown. And I'm just going to briefly talk about some of the activities or experiments that um, we've used to help illustrate a lot of these um, benefits. So the first is growing a tree. It's really important to get kids and young, young people to think about what the power of a tree is. What are the products and services that the trees can provide? An easy way to do that, there are many different ways, but one way is to create a tree in a classroom, outside side uh, community hall, and each day, students write what products and services trees can provide, and they place it on the tree. And that tree starts to grow, and they start to think as well about all the different things that the tree can provide. Did you know that there are over 5,000 products that can come from trees? A lot of people didn't know that, and you get kids thinking. So the, the potential to have really a lot, huge paper canopy is immense. Talk about some of the benefits like soil erosion. Trees prevent soil erosion or can slow it down. And then demonstrate that. And I think many of you have seen this um, in my office, those who have been in the Washington DC office. But if not, this is a soil erosion experiment that I uh, built out using recycled bottles. And you get the kids to pour water in each of the three containers and then ask them which water would you swim in? Why do you think the bottle on the left has the clearest amount of water coming out from it? Never tell them the answer. You just simply demonstrate and have them and empower them to come up with the answers themselves. <clears throat> and then you can tie other things like the next two experiments to iTree. 
So iTree can calculate stormwater runoff, as, some, as somebody said, and ask them, how can you slow down stormwater? And you explain what stormwater is and absorption of water and what runoff is. And then you can show them visually how it does that. And this is a rainfall simulator. And you, this can be created rather easily. And as you can see, the different types of surfaces, you can create different types, one with gravel, for example, or just all, or all mulch, and just watch the infiltrate, what gets down into the soil, and then what comes off as runoff. Again, letting the uh, students think for themselves about the why and the how. Climate change in a bottle. Can trees cool down the environment by sequestering carbon? Again, introducing them to several vocabulary words and tying this to iTree later on as they learn more and as they grow. And this is the climate change in a bottle experiment. I did this for a bunch of second graders. And in one bottle, we had a plant. In another bottle, we didn't have it. And we had a heat lamp and watch the thermometers in each bottle rise. And over time, they, we kept these in the classroom and over time they were able to observe that the bottle that had the plant in it was significantly cooler. And by significant, I'm talking about one degree or two degrees cooler than the other bottle. And Karin had mentioned beauty of trees. We, we can talk about that. Can trees make a space more beautiful? What does that mean? Can you create art? from trees. And here's some of my favorite artists. And here are some of my favorite artists out there, Patrick Doherty, Lorenzo Duran, and Andy Goldsworthy. And I've had the pleasure of teaching this to my kids' school. Um, I teach artists, I volunteer to teach art. And so these are some of the inspirational artists that we've used when we had a theme on environment and um, art. Other benefits, tree tags can show how every how trees or what other values trees provide. In Melbourne, this is one of my favorite initiatives, which is each tree was assigned an email address, and you would not believe the tens of thousands of emails that came through um, and were sent to these particular trees, and it just really shows that trees have such a um, a mental health benefit. It makes people happy. So they wrote these, and um, I will send out a link with some other examples, and they're so lovely. And also the spiritual value of trees. Let's not forget that this is um, on the foreground there playing on the drum is Ashim Berry, one of our seminar participants who led a forest bathing activity right after our seminar in India where people could connect back to nature. And then what? That's the big question. So what, So the kids have learned these, what do you do then? Well, then you go deeper into the tools. As you can see, iTree is a suite of tools. And um, many of these can be used by kids, and Dr. Dave will talk more about it. MyTree is one of them. Design, canopy, and eco can also be used, and they are the ones that are readily available to be used overseas. You can layer it with other management tools. So we're exploring how we can um, use rapid social assessments with young people and then use that information to layer it on top of the iTree information. What does that give us? What does that tell us? And then we can start discussing stewardship. Once you understand your resources, then you can talk about how to care for it. And here's some of the fun activities that we've done um, at a couple of different expos that we've um, attended. So in summary, we want to highlight the principles behind the tool. We want to excite students with the science. We want to link where we can to iTree, create fun activities, and explore with and without technology. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Dave, who will go deeper into um, the iTree tools and, and his work with young people. Just really briefly, are there any questions?
Dr. Dave, are you ready? I'm going to um, make you the presenter. Okay. There we go. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. And now you see the full screen, right? Yes. Okay, great. Um, Isa, that was a, a great presentation and a great introduction to iTree as well as some of the um, the interesting and really powerful programs that uh, involve the youth. And it's so important, um, and that's where I, with the research station at the Forest Service, feel that the uh, integration of the youth is the uh, future, and it's the way that we can um, create the scientists of the future and the scientists of today. So. We, um, we're excited about uh, partnering on this, especially bringing, uh, bringing iTree out to other regions of the uh, country and around the world. Um, this slide here, I just want to show you where I'm presenting from. I, uh, my office is located at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, Massachusetts, it's up in the uh, Northeast United States. And right now I'm coming from Springfield, Massachusetts. And some of you might know Springfield, um, it's the home of um, the cat in the hat, Dr. Seuss, the Lorax, and uh, green eggs and ham. So Dr. Seuss is from Springfield, where I, I live. And um, we have a, uh, actually, if you ever have a chance to come visit the uh, Dr. Seuss uh, Museum and the, um, uh, the, the uh, sculpture garden, it's pretty um, interesting, it's exciting, and it's a great place to bring your kids. But one of the things that we uh, work with the population here, I'm going to show you a couple things that bring us into iTree, but I'm going to show you some of the uh, the programming that we've done over the past several years with youth in Springfield. We have a population that's a, a mid-sized American city, 153,000 people, the fourth largest city in New England. Um, and But you'll see here we have a um, over 25% of the population lives below the poverty level. And so there's some challenges and um, some opportunities that are presented that excite us and, and really provide us the opportunity to do some um, great things with the youth. So what we do in, um, with the Forest Service and the city of Springfield, along with a nonprofit partner down the bottom, we Green Springfield, is engaging youth through hands-on programming. And we have several programs that we use, and we brand them in order to have a a uh, um, sort of a, a continuity in, in what we're offering. So we have Eco Adventure Springfield and Off to the Great, Door, uh, Great Outdoors Learning Through Nature. So both of these programs we've established working in conjunction with the city and with Reed Green Springfield, and each of them provides a um, an opportunity to engage the youth. And then as Liza explained, iTree, it's a um, you know, international program and it's developing tools for assessing and managing community trees and forests. So we're looking at not only individual trees from say an arboricultural standpoint, but the whole urban forest from a, a, a ecosystem uh, standpoint. So we're looking at that continuum from the center of a city, the city center, all the way out to suburban and forested landscapes that might surround an urban, dense urban core. And we, um, it's free and it's, um, we'll explain a little bit about that, but it's based on peer reviewed science by our scientists and our partners with universities and industry. We provide technical support and we're always, in, and as I just said, it's about 12 years old and down the bottom of the screen, you'll see some of our partners here with the National Arbor Day Foundation, the Society of Missile Arborists, the International Society of Arboriculture, um, uh, uh, State University of New York and, and um, uh, at ESF, Casey Trees, and then Davy Tree. So we have a, a bunch of folks that are working with us to improve it and bring it out to uh, folks around the world. And the idea is iTree, which we talked a little bit earlier, um, means the inventory of tree resources, economic and environmental. So we're looking at a tree or a forest or the landscape, and we're looking at the structure. So what do we have? What is the percentage of red maple trees or palm trees or pistachio trees? What, are, what size are they? What condition are they? So what makes up the urban forest? 
or the study area that we're looking at. So the structure, then the function. What are those trees or what does an individual tree do? How much carbon does it store? How much rainfall does it intercept? How much particulate matter will it um, be able to uh, clean out of the air? Um, and a variety of other functions that um, the tree will provide. And then we convert that into a value to what are the trees worth? And the general way we do that is we convert it into a currency or a monetary value so that we can then put a value on that individual tree all the way up to the, um, the urban forest or a collection of trees in an area or a region or on a property. And then we're able to look at the value of that and we can really look at it in, 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 in terms that are comparative to other things in that landscape. So for instance, as an urban forest city manager, you might be looking at, I need to get X amount of dollars to care for my trees. And so in order to go to your city council or your town council or the public and have a voted in to spend money, you can't just say we want money for trees because they look nice, or we can't say, oh, um, that our trees um, need this amount of uh, input of uh, funding. We need to have a value of what they're giving us back. So we look at a cost-benefit analysis in iTree for every dollar we invest in our trees, what do we get back in dollars? So if you take Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania, for instance, for every dollar, that we invest, we get back $2.94 in value, okay? And so it's like if you build or pave a, a build a building or pave a roadway, the minute we uh, finish that project, it, 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 it lessens in value because it starts to wear or deteriorate or uh, gets older. Whereas a tree, the minute we plant that for a dollar, ten dollars, or three hundred or five hundred, it's going to increase in value over its lifetime because it's going to get bigger. It's going to provide more value. It's going to provide more benefit. So we look at that, and that's the hallmark of uh, how iTree is looked at: structure, function, and value. And so the vision of it is to really improve the forest and human health, and we look at it through easy-to-use technology. It's easy for not only um, you know um, scholars or researchers or scientists or managers to use, but all the way down to the young kids here. Um, and those are some of our folks in Springfield um, outside uh, one of the schools that we're working in. And so the idea is iTree opens up a lot of opportunities for um, a community. You can prioritize where you're going to want to put resources. You can look at areas that are, um, are lacking in trees or areas that we uh, need to support environmental justice and, and air quality and water quality and access to green space. and the health of the trees, the health of the people, and then connecting the urban with the uh, forested landscape, such as our Urban Connections Program of the Forest Service, where we connect folks from inner cities to forest uh, service lands that are out, out, out in the wilderness. And so the idea is we look at air quality, stormwater, and as I said, sustainability, equity, and public health. And those are all the hallmarks of how I work. So let me just give you a little quickly an explanation of what we do in Springfield, and this is what's led us to um, actually trying to bring this program out to a wider audience. We have a thing, um, a program for adults. It's called Eco Adventure Springfield, and it's aimed at adults and youth, like in high school ages and um, 9 to 14, 9 to 15 years old, and it's self-paced, hands-on environmental outdoor activities where folks go on scavenger hunts and they find things and eco adventures and get out in the wilderness, but it's all on their own, whether it be a, a, um, a scavenger hunt that they can do on a smartphone or a scavenger hunt where they take the, uh, go on the internet and grab some information and then head out and enter a contest or provide information back to a project. So that's what we, um, when we're working with our adults and then off to the great outdoors is the one where we're dealing with our, our youth. And we're looking at sixth, seventh, and eighth graders uh, primarily, and then also high school students. And it's hands-on instruction where iTree plays an integral part of the overall learning experience. So what I want to do is I'm just going to focus on our Off to the Great Outdoors program and a little bit about that and how we approach it and how we integrate iTree into the program. So Off to the Great Outdoors, we have a summer program that goes for two months in July and August. 
and we have eight four-hour sessions. It's indoors and outdoors. During the school year, we have 20 two-hour sessions that go to November to May. It's indoor and outdoor. And then we also have a high school program in October through November, and it's eight sessions um, that we carry out. And all of these involve indoor classroom uh, study, instruction, and experience, and then go on to the outdoor adventures where we head outside and start to do some um, um, components out in the outdoor laboratory. And so iTree plays an integral role in all of these, and that's what we like to, we like to uh, stress that iTree becomes sort of a foundational a pillar or a foundational block in the construction of this learning experience. And you'll see there's the same kids out in front of our pollinator garden. Here's some of our youth, and um, these kids are in fifth grade, um, and, and they're doing some, some work together. We try to have folks work in teams. We try to do a little bit of uh, 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 contestant things where we have prizes for the kids when they get um, the most number of whatever we're looking for or the most correct uh, things that they find or the largest tree or the most pine cones that they uh, pick up or whatever we're looking at. And you can see all the kids, um, you know, it's, it's tough being in an after school program for kids um, to really be engaged the whole time. And You'll see two of our uh, youth mentors in the back, both college students that come in and help us. We have a series of uh, uh, high school and college students that help us with the kids. And you'll see here, um, we're having pretty good success and, 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 and kids are having fun. And that's one of the key elements of this. How can we make the kids really have an experience um, and go out and experience some great outdoors, and, but have fun doing it and not be bored? So here's one of our, our collection where they're looking for pine cones and they have a little contest and they get in groups of three and they go out into the landscape. One of the things, we always don't have money uh, in a lot of communities to buy tools like a diameter breast type um, a tape, a DDH tape, or to have a, um, a, a tree canopy density meter or a clinometer that measures the height of a tree or a soil probe. So a lot of times we'll we'll work with the kids who um, just as as a low cost, inexpensive way to do things. And on the right, you'll see um, the kids here with a clinometer or a tree height measurement tool that they made with a compass, a straw, a piece of string, and a, a little weight. But the one thing we're trying to do is um, try to have the kids become engaged, but also understand the importance of collecting good data. But collecting data in any event in keeping track of it and archiving it. So you'll see with the clipboard here, this student is recording the information on the heights of trees, recording on the sheet. And then when they come back, we take all of the data that they collect and we put it in a, a binder for each group. So they have a binder or a, uh, a catalog of what they've done for the year um, or during the whole entire session. And I'll show you another part of that in a minute. Okay, so the key concepts that we do, uh, we look at the big picture of things. So we start by looking at atmosphere, weather, climate, climate change, water, and pollution. Then we zero in on the urban forest, where we start to talk about ecology, the water cycle, soil, plants, vegetation, wildlife, and tree canopy. And then from tree canopy, we jump over, and this is where we get involved with eye trees. So the second half of all these courses involves eye tree, where we teach them how to look for the structure, function, and value of a tree. So tree identification we teach. We teach the tree canopy itself and how to uh, measure it and look at percentage of tree canopy that's over a particular area. We can look at using eye tree to calculate the benefits. We show them and we teach them how to measure a tree, the diameter of a trunk, the height of a tree. Then we help them to map the location and then also to collect the data in a way that it goes into field notes and, and can be archived. And one of the ways we do that is we give each kid or each student or each uh, camper um, or um, engaged group a, a field book. And that's theirs to keep for the, uh, the duration. So in addition to the data sheets they collect, they also do a daily or a you know, each time we have the class, a reflection and do a little bit of drawing and, and filling out of uh, things that were important to them as they went out into the field that day. And so then they have at the end of the experience their field book. And now we've worked with a couple classes over a two year period. So they just take that field book 
and they they sort of treasure these things and they we have them fill in you know use the same book the next year so they have two years of experience that they can go back to and and reflect on or look as as a journal one of the other things we really stress with the kids is is just to um, in this case with tree identification is come up with a, we come up with a method for them to do things we try to keep it as simple as we can so here you'll see on the left it's a uh, just a paper on the, the tree number the type you know species size and condition but you can also do it as we get into the high school students to archive the data electronically so we developed some um, tools for them to use smartphones tablets or iPads out in the field and collect data that will populate a database that's an electronic format and you see this one on the right here is just a screen capture of a simple data collection form to keep your trees um, just in case they I mean identification and size so this is a 31 inch pistachio tree in excellent condition that like uses um, the smartphone so we try to work with them on on that but one of the critical things is how do they you know they have to measure they have to count and one of the things that's really um, the one of the harder things to teach but one of the more rewarding for the students is species identification and this is just an example of um, a, an identification book from India that we were working with with the uh, the folks in Delhi um, but here's some of ours from uh, Springfield where the kids make their own little tree keys and this one on the right is from high school kids um, and leaves are simple or compound and alternate and lobe and the ones on the left were um, another one that were done by seventh and eighth graders that they actually used a, a leaf and put it on um, on a key uh, and so they learn a, you know how to go through a, uh, a tree identification key but in this case here we have them sort of make their own and we really try to encourage them to do that uh, learning as they can based on their interests. So they may be interested in drawing, they may be interested in collecting, they may be interested in, in, in some other type of learning. Whatever they can do to learn the tree identification is, is critical to us and them. One of the neat things is we pre um, examine or pre-inventory the, the trees on the campus and in the neighborhood where the classes are so they really generally only have to identify about 15 different kinds of trees and in many cases they only need five or six for the school grounds that they're working on so the tree identification isn't a total tree identification of 200 uh, trees or shrubs it's just the identification of what they're likely to find in their own experience um, on the grounds at the school or when they go home. The other thing here is now we're going to teach them or uh, help them to develop tools that are going to, uh, here they are making DBH tapes. They're going to help them to record information on the size of a tree. And then a clonometer, as I showed you earlier, this is one I uh, uh, demonstrate to the kids, uh, a, a built one. And then we try to uh, enlist um, other kids to take the course um, over the course of the summer. So these are some kids that are going into high school, on the, the two kids in orange. So they were at a field day we had, and they uh, actually joined us for that following summer. We were just trying to encourage them and show them some things. So here's the DBH tape, and you'll see the, um, the, the, the child on the left here. She's measuring the diameter of a tree with the tape she made just from simple, um, uh, simple uh, survey tape. And you'll see on the right, the kids are built, making their own survey uh, DBH tape. Um, by using survey tape and then they mark every inch along it so then they go out and they measure the circumference of a tree and then from there after measuring the circumference we uh, have them record it and then we bring it in and we convert it to diameter so they're learning a little bit about um, uh, you know um, math along the way so we talk to them about you know how you can convert circumference to diameter and diameter is really the true measure of how you can uh, look at the age or size of a tree. The other thing we're doing, as I said, making the clonometer here out of a simple protractor that you can buy, you know, for 50 cents and a, a straw and just a, a string and a little weight. And here again, there's that same picture of the youth collecting the information. So we're trying to develop citizen scientists, and, and the kids truly are scientists because they're going out and collecting they're observing collecting and archiving and that's what uh, scientists does 
And then we showed them some other things here. Of, this is measuring tree heights um, using a pencil or um, looking at people stacked on top of each other visually or also uh, getting a 45 degree angle by um, looking through your legs back up at the tree and then you measure the, uh, once you can see the top of the tree, you can measure the distance and you got the height of the tree. So we try to teach them the simple, easy, and least expensive ways to do things. And so we have to collect that information and then when we have the information, then they can learn to sort of explore what does that mean. And that's where we get into the eye tree component. So we're going to look at my tree, eye tree design, and eye tree canopy. And then with high school and adult students, we get into eye tree eco. Now keep in mind, my tree and eye tree design can't be used internationally, but eye tree canopy is one that works all over the world, and that's one that tells a big story, and I'll show you in a minute. And then eye tree eco, we can also um, extrapolate data and plug in data um, with a little bit of uh, Manipulation works, so that's why we uh, save that for the adults or the high school students. So my tree, it's a smartphone application. It also works on a, um, a tablet or on a laptop. But what it is is it's eye tree on the go, we call it, where you go out. And in this case here, they looked at a Chinese elm tree, and they were able to look at the, uh, the value of that tree and the amount of carbon uh, dioxide absorbed each year. You can see 27, 78 pounds. Stormwater intercepted, uh, 4,618 gallons. Energy uh, savings, and all of these are spelled out here in a neat, easy way to understand what's going on with a single tree or a collection of trees. Just by going out, the kids go out, they determine what kind of tree it is, what size it is, and they input their data right on a smartphone or on a tablet. And then the benefit tag here again is, is pretty cool, but here's the kids getting the BBH of the tree, as I showed you earlier. And in this case here, there's a live oak tree, and we're able to calculate that with my tree, which is kind of neat. And then you can take that information and convert it into things like this. These are tree tags, we call them, um, and tag sale trees. And you can see here that the trees provide $631 in benefits over the next 15 years. This tree here over the next 15 years is going to save energy $91. So the one on the right is from Michigan State University. The one on the left is the one that we have the kids use in Springfield. And that's all part, this is at an event we had with the neighborhood, a tree scavenger hunt, you'll see. And um, it's kind of cool when we can start to integrate everybody in the, in the process. And here's some, these are from Australia actually, where they're looking at um, a, a gray box tree and it, it, IMA. So they're not looking at this tree, they're telling you what kind of tree I am. I'm 17 meters tall, I provide and I do all these components. So they're personalizing a tree and I'm over 300 years old. So, um, and on the right, just uh, property values, habitat, energy, et cetera. So the kids can make these signs, they calculate the information, and then we tell the story by folks uh, seeing those tags on the trees outside. This is another one that we can use um, in the U.S. and it uh, looks at individual parcels and or a neighborhood. This one here, you'll see the blue house has been highlighted here. So and there's a, a little tree right there, an American basswood or a linden, 24 inches in diameter. So you input the um, the data on the trees that the kids would collect. And then they would, um, you see here, that's the same kid on a different project. Um, but here we can look at one or many trees and we come up with some information and some reporting on the value of the tree. And again, here, iTree Design, it's going to report out not only the current year on stormwater, energy, air quality, and carbon, but we can also look at trees in future years. And in this case here, you're looking ahead um, until 2077. So the idea is you can, from one to 99 years ahead, project and give us some information on what a tree will provide. This is another one that can be used around the world. This is um, I Tree Canopy. And here we are with always the principles of what we're doing. In this case here, showing the kids getting out and experience the shade right there, and we're pointing out some things in the tree but have them experience that a tree canopy is really a collection of trees. So 
we take them out and we do bark rubbing and other things and measure and count. So they understand that the trees are tied into the tree canopy. And what that canopy does, we work with them. In this case, they did this little neighborhood in Springfield. You'll see the red box outline. And then all of those little squares, I mean, all those um, target points are individual um, locations where we identify the land cover. And on the right is some of the reporting. So impervious building, grass and shrubs. And then if we hit a tree, we would do that. And in this case here, you know, we collect data on about 500 trees and can come up with a report that looks something like this. So the top part is just the statistical uh, reporting that talks about uh, the standard error as well as our confidence interval. But down below is just the, um, the, the percentage of each point. In this case here, um, it's the, uh, the tree um, in that area and it reports out like this. So um, you're able to show that in, in, in this report here, we had tree cover here of about um, in land cover uh, 1.00 or 0.028. So you can report that out in percentages or in acres or area in hectares um, and in, in any kind of a dollar amount or any kind of financial uh, currency amount you want to use around the world. And then you can report out in an infographic form something like this that tells the story of your canopy. So the kids really like that as we um, go through because they can actually come up with a report, they can tell the story, and they have information to share. And this is the, the um, most advanced one we use, which is the iTree Eco. And it quantifies, again, the tree and the forest resources, the structure, the function, and then uh, look at the value. So all of this is a, um, is, is, is a pretty interesting one where it's plot-based, where we go out. And it starts right here with our field data that the cities collect. And it ties in with pollution data, city um, data and demographics, the weather, and then species and location. And then we come up with a statistical estimate with all of the, um, the values that are produced. And you'll see on the right here, that's just the user interface. But we can report out uh, reports that um, you can select variables and, and the idea of what you want contained in your report. So it depends on the story you're trying to tell. And that's why we use this with the more advanced students and adults. And then they can report out, and you'll see here, iTree Eco being used around the world, in this case in Canada and here in, 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 in Great Britain, as well as in uh, Santo Domingo. So those are just some examples of taking the data from iTree and, and, and producing a report, producing a, um, a tree tag, or produce an infographic. So all of those uh, variables are something that we really work with the students to tie iTree into their great experience here from the big picture all the way down to the individual tree or the areas that we're examining. And one of the key things I'll just put in here, we work with them not only on the school grounds, but we'll go to nearby um, uh, public park areas that have uh, trees or we'll work with them to actually go home and measure trees on their own uh, property, whether they live in a, uh, a multi-family home, a single-family home, or an apartment block. We have them uh, actually go home and we do a uh, uh, eco-assessment of their own property. So that's part of the whole process. And we try to tie in the parents and adults on the take-home one, um, but we cover it all during the classes. And we're really excited about um, the feedback we've gotten uh, from not only the folks in Springfield, but we're working with the state of Massachusetts to bring this uh, statewide. And then through programs at the Forest Service, we're trying to um, develop a way to bring this out um, on, on a larger scale. And part of it is here with our international audience. So I think that's about what I had to say, Liza. Um, so if there's any questions, I, we can try to answer those, or um, you can all get on. And, See where we are, and you can take control back so we can see everybody's face, and everybody turn on your your video so we can see you. I think you're going to have to get some unshare your screen, and I have to unshare it. There me, we go. Yeah, okay, there you go. Uh, thanks. Okay. Um, are there any questions, Allison? Do we have? Any questions from the chat? 
Oh yeah, there's a bunch. Yeah, we have a we have a question from Karen for Dr. Dave. Are the high school and college students paid for their work um, with Off to the Great Outdoors program? Uh, now the kids in high school are paid by the city, and then the college students are not because I teach at the University of Massachusetts. And so what I do is I offer them individual uh, what we call practicum credits. So they get a three credit a practicum for working in Springfield. So they'll get a three credit, um, sort of like an independent study, but a practicum means you're hands on working. So I work with them that way. So we don't have the cash. We're trying to keep it as low as we can. The city provides as part of, because we only come in one day on each of the programs. They have their staff there for the five days of the after school programs and the summer camps. But all of our excuse me, UMass students um, or Springfield Technical Community College students, um, we give them credit. So that's cost savings and you know that's the beauty of being a a professor, I guess, in a cooperative agreement with the university and the forest service. I get to teach and I get to invest students in, in cool projects like this. Indeed. And um, one thing I wanted to add to Dr. Dave's uh, the end of his presentation, especially with ECO and the field collection of data, is that it really does allow the student to be part of something bigger. So if, for example, uh, in Delhi, where we're building out um, iTree ECO, um, one of our NGO partners, So Good Farms, they have trees in their schoolyard and the students that they work with can collect data on their schoolyard and then that data can get inputted into um, iTree Eco, and it becomes part of the, um, the it becomes part of the activity, the the data collection. It becomes part of the um, data that's collected for the city itself. And so, when kids understand that they're part of something bigger, it really does make them feel like scientists, which they are. As Mike yeah. says, you know, everyone is a scientist. That's what I try to tell them. You're, it doesn't matter what age you are, you're a scientist. And when you when you give a kid a book like this, the field notes, you know, it's actually it, it, they're so excited to be part of something bigger. And um, these books become a little thing that they put in their, their treasure. So that's one cool thing. The other thing is we've just developed iTree database, which isn't it's not ready for distribution publicly or widespread yet internationally. But that'll be a way that all the data collected by anybody anywhere that uses iTree is going to go into one giant database. So we'll have some metadata and um, it'll be just, oh, who worked in, you know, who worked in Delhi or who worked in Cairo or who worked in Springfield Vast. That data you can search in a database and it'll come up with all the information that everybody's collected. So we're working to bring that out over the next year. It's all exciting. So I understand. I understand we're at the end of our time here, but um, Dr. Dave, I don't know if if you are ready to hop off on, um, on another meeting, but I can stay for a few minutes in case other people do want to uh, uh, have more questions or want to discuss this in, in detail. But before we leave, I do want to ask folks um, if, you know, if the presentation, if it's debunked a little bit of the assumptions and the myths about teaching iTree to young people and um, has it made it more, I guess, palatable or easier to understand, um, do we need another, se another session to do a deeper dive? So just wanted to pose that question for everyone. Um, let us know. Liza, we offer every month an iTree uh, webcast. Um, we generally don't do it in, in July and August, but uh, I can get you the next one when we schedule it for September. That's once a month. And folks can join. And we always talk about timely topics. And every year in January, we have a roundtable with the development team and the scientists behind iTree. So you're all welcome to join that. But the monthly webcasts are um, always on how to use iTree, and, any, um, and we tie in education with that, we tie in science, and that might be interesting for some of you to join us. We'd be happy to have you. And if you do want to take a deeper dive into iTree, you know, as well as that, uh, I'm always willing to spread the word and help you out.
Great. Don't be back. We have a few more questions, Allison. Do we? Yeah. Um, Karen asked if there is an effort to get this information to city arborists or municipal and county governments. Yeah, that, well, yeah, from uh, Ma uh, the Massachusetts scale, you know, because we're doing it in Springfield and we present, we're going to be presenting, um, we hope to have a, a new developed sort of, this is what I'm working on right now, and we just got a little funding for it, is to develop a, an entire uh, sort of compendium with a teacher volume and a uh, student volume. And it will be combining all of the resources that we currently have in various places and put them all in one thing. And we're going to present that next uh, January at the uh, Massachusetts Tree Wardens and Foresters Association. And we're going to get that out in Massachusetts. But the goal of the funding we got, it was just, it was, um, I think, $3,000 from the Forest Service um, to do, do this. The goal of theirs is to get it out into our urban network we have. And we have a bunch of urban field stations. So we'll be getting out to them. So I, I would just look at it as a good opportunity. But, it, you know, we've only been doing this for three years. and sort of by trial and error, taking programs from other places and utilizing other resources. There's so much out there. And you know, if we had a couple hours, we could show you some of the other things that are used, um, you know, by um, other organizations. You know, NASA has um, their GLOBE project, and then there's also a series of other data collection things out there that we can engage students with. So it's kind of cool. I just saw a question here. Have your challenges of teaching to you? Um, the challenge is, is, is more of a, that's why we don't go and start with iTree. I try to do some of the things that Faisal showed. You know, we do, we build a rain gauge, we build a, um, a wind gauge, we build a, you know, uh, and we do soil. We do a bunch of other things that keep the kids really excited. And so once they're engaged and excited, they look forward to coming to the class. So it's not like, oh, we have to go to that class again with that old man and his kids. So I try not to do any of the teaching. I let the kids do it because they can connect with the younger kids. But the hardest thing is keeping their attention. And we do that by making it exciting, the, you know, the first few classes. And it's sort of like once they're hooked, they're hooked for good. And then they come in and you wouldn't believe the response of the young kids when you connect with them. You know, we have... They hang in their summer camps. I, I wish I could show you a picture, but I have a couple of our college kids, and they're, they're big, huge kids, a couple of the guys. These kids hang on their shirts and won't let them leave. They won't, you know, they're holding them as they're walking, loading the, the truck back up with all of our tables and gear and stuff. They say, oh, you can't leave, you can't leave, because they connect so much. Because a lot of these kids, you know, especially in the inner city of Springfield, we have a lot of... Um, the families where the kids live with their grandparents or their single, um, you know, single parent households and they have no connection and it's so powerful. And our students, I think, get as much out of the program as the participant youth. My college students that take and help us, they are sort of, they realize how lucky they are to be where they are in college and how some people don't have very much. And they really, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's got to be a life-changing experience for them. I, we've never had anybody leave us, and they're all moved. And, you know, by the time we're done, they have uh, they're sort of mentors for them. And that's why we get this. This is why we went to the last year. We said, okay, kids, let's come on. We'll do you another year. So we bring them in for that second year. And, um now everything got interrupted in um, March with the, the coronavirus shutdown of our schools. So we're bringing it all virtual starting on July 16th, I think it is, or 15th. I'm not sure which of the days, but on Monday, we're going online to, we're going to have about uh, 100 kids online through five different sessions. And um, that should be pretty fun. Thanks, Dr. Dave. And um, we are also piloting this, Lucretia, with our, in Rwanda. We've created a crane cruiser, which is similar to a mobile conservation classroom. Uh, the only difference is that um, rather than having the students go inside a bus that has been transformed into a classroom, we've created stations 
one of the stations, which and these stations are outside the the cruiser itself, outside of the um, vehicle, and one of the stations will focus on eye tree. And again, like Dr. Dave said, we're going to start not with the tool, but with all the principles first behind it. We are um, we will be pilot testing it once we get the cruiser over to Rwanda, and then we'll let you know what the challenges are in teaching it. But this is going to be one of the first times that it's, uh, we're teaching young people overseas on the tool itself. So uh, stay tuned for that. Are there any other questions or comments? Um, this is being this has been recorded and we will uh, send this recording out to everybody. Thanks, Karen, and thank you, Helen, for your feedback. All right. Okay, thank you all um, for um, paying attention and uh, for the comments. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Rima. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Ingrid. Thank you so much. It was very lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Mohammed. Oh, Mohammed, thank you. That's nice to see. And then Eliza and Allison, I guess I'll talk to you next week after yeah. the holiday. Yeah. Okay, well, yeah. have a good, great fourth. Yeah, I will. And then, yeah. um, Eliza, I just need to talk to you at some point.